Good evening, everybody. Welcome to Books and Books. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. Before we get started, very quickly with our panel event tonight on uh, perspectives in food, uh, take a look at the Books and Books newsletter. For those of you who have never heard me do this before, pick up a copy of this. Uh, this will give you a rundown of all the wonderful events we have at Books and Books every night of the week. Uh, a couple worth mentioning. Upcoming, uh, Nicholas Sparks will be at the Wolfson campus. We had uh, Sir Salman Rushdie there last night. Uh, Jeff Lindsay of Dexter fame from HBO. Even Elizabeth Gilbert. We have tickets on sale for all these events and the books for sale. As also I mentioned before, uh, this event is being live streamed as are many of our events now at Books and Books. So if you cannot make the events, you can always check out our archive or watch it live. If you call us at the store, we can also send you an autographed copy of the books that are being presented for that evening. But tonight it gives me great pleasure to introduce our host for the evening. He's Dr. Michael Gillespie. He's the director of the Humanities Department at Florida National University. He's going to be introducing your panelists tonight. Again, the topic tonight is four perspectives on food in our lives. Please give him and them a nice round of applause. Thanks very much, Steve. Um, I'm actually not going to do the <coughs> do the introductions, but rather uh, the uh, the commercial announcements that uh, that we have to do to uh, thank, rightfully so, the people that, that did so much to uh, make this and and other uh, humanity center presentations possible. Um, to begin with, we're very grateful to our our host for the evening, uh, Mitchell Kaplan, Kaplan, Christina Nosti, Victor Santiago, Steve Moss, who you just heard, and all the staff at Books and Books. This is a lovely venue. We feel very privileged to be here, and we're uh, grateful for their hospitality. I'm also grateful for the hospitality of uh, Vizcaya M Museum that will be hosting our next food event, uh, particularly Anne Loshaw, Rebecca Peterson, and uh, Joel Hoffman. On October 9th, uh, 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 Mark D'Alessandro, a uh, professor in the food services uh, uh, school, I'm sorry, the School of Hospitality, and uh, also a, uh, a local chef will talk about the, uh, the juxtaposition or perhaps the collision of Italian and Italian-American uh, food uh, in a, uh, a lecture entitled Fosito. It will be at the, um, at the uh, Vizcaya Garage, which is a lot more elegant than the, the name uh, suggests, uh, at uh, 6 o'clock on October 9th, free and open to the public. Uh, Please don't hesitate to contact the center if you'd like more information. There are pamphlets uh, on a brochure on the center that has our uh, uh, contact information as well, and I hope you'll feel free to uh, help yourself to them. Uh, I would also like to thank Neil Hecker, uh, Dolores Sudeco, uh, Sarah Ryan, who is doing the recording, and all the staff of uh, Channel 2 uh, that uh, record all of our center events and make them available on the center website. So if you want to relive this evening, and who wouldn't, uh, You'll, you'll be able in a week or so to go back to the website or you can tell your friends how much they missed and they can actually see exactly what they missed. Uh, I'm grateful to Aramis Martinez, the uh, program assistant at the center who does all the heavy lifting and then steps back and let, lets me act as if I've done it all. Uh, I'm, I'm grateful to the Departments of English, History, and the College of Arts and Sciences at Florida International. And I'm extremely grateful to the members of the uh, committee uh, on, on uh, food and, and thought, food and discussion, that began to meet last spring and that did so much to put together this evening and the subsequent uh, series. Two of, those, uh, uh, two of those committee members, April uh, Merlot and Gail Hollander, are part of the panel. Uh, also, Vic, uh, I'm sorry, Nick Vagnoni will be uh, introducing everyone, and Billy Hall is uh, another, uh, pan uh, another committee member who's here. I'm grateful to them. And finally, I'm very grateful to all of you for coming tonight. It really uh, gives the, these events a great deal of energy to have people who are informed and enthusiastic, and I can tell uh, hungry as well. So thank you very much for coming. Let me turn you over to uh, Nick, who will do the introductions. Hi. Welcome. Uh, thank you all for being here. Uh, I'll keep the introductions quick, and we can get on to our panelists. I'll start with uh, Dr. Gail Hollander. Uh, 
She is an associate professor in the Department of Global and Sociocultural Studies, and her research interests include economic geography, agro-environmental conflict, food system theory, and feminist geography. And her latest book is Raising Cain in the Glades, The Global Sugar Trade and the Transformation of Florida. Next, we'll have Muriel Olivares, a local farmer and founder and operator of the Little River Market Garden, which is a quarter-acre farm. Uh, CSA provides about 35 members, is that, yeah, about 35 members with fruits, vegetables, herbs, and flowers every year. And before she was uh, at Little River, she was working at uh, Bee Heaven Farms in the Redlands and also uh, Four Winds Farms, Hudson Valley, right? Yeah, okay. Uh, next, we'll have um, Professor April Merlot. And April's research focuses on 20th century United States in an international context. Um, teaches courses on uh, late 19th, 20th centuries, including modern American civilization, US food history, critical food studies, uh, and also some specialized seminars covering histories of environment, labor, immigration, and globalization. And finally, we'll have uh, Keith Kalmanovich. Um, Keith grew up in northeastern Pennsylvania, worked in his family's grocery store and restaurant, and after a lot of traveling and study, uh, wound up here in Miami, uh, working at restaurants like BLT Steak, Harry's Pizzeria, and Michael's Genuine. And Keith now works from Earth and Us Farm in Little Haiti, where he hosts Love and Vegetables, a uh, monthly pay-what-you-can farm dinner. So uh, here are our panelists. Gail? I'm sorry, I, uh, <coughs> I'll just uh, uh, interrupt one for the final time uh, to give you an idea of the format. All four of the uh, speakers will give about five to seven minute presentations with the idea of, of enraging you so that, that when we're finished <laughs> with, the first, with the four presentations, uh, there'll be time for discussion. But we'll hold questions and responses until all four have uh, spoken because I think there's a lot of complementarity in what they're going to be saying and then, uh, and then we'll have time to chat about it. Thank you. Thank you, Michael, Nick, and Billy for uh, organizing this and for giving us all a chance to talk about our favorite thing, <laughs> which is food. Um, so at FIU, I teach a course on the global food system. And we start by looking at everyday food items and deconstructing them. And we find that pretty much everything we eat is linked to the global food system. That system, of course, is not new. Its roots date back at least 500 years to the time when maritime trade knitted the world together and linked diverse ecosystems. And as you may have guessed, I see that Florida, uh, South Florida, was very much a part of and impacted by globalization. For example, in the transformation of the Everglades uh, into a sugar industry. But even closer to home, Miami has been connected to the global food system in a multitude of ways. In the 19th century, um, through circuits of labor. So George Merrick, uh, who developed Coral Gables, as you know, uh, and historians after him, um, because George Merrick actually did write some histories of Miami, um, credits black workers brought from the Bahamas as laborers for, quote, a vital influence upon our civilization in Miami in bringing in their own commonly used trees, vegetables, and fruits. and uh, more importantly, in bringing their knowledge and their capacity to cultivate the pine rocklands of Miami, which wouldn't have happened without them coming here. So for early 20th century land developers, botanists and horticulturalists, Miami was this amazing tropical spot on an otherwise temperate uh, continent. It became the locus for bringing in all kinds of tropical and subtropical food crops to see if they could make them work here. And some of this was for commercial production, some for residential, because Miami was envisioned as a place where every home could have tropical fruit trees and grow beans during the winter. Developers marketed houses promising true grapefruit trees with every house. So why do we often think of the global food system as some scary thing? as opposed to local food production, or as a threat to public health. It's been with us a long time, fed us, been in our backyard, and so why are we so freaked out? 
Why are we trying to draw the line between something that we call global and something else that is local? One reason, I think, is that this round of globalization is distinct from previous eras, in that a greater share of our economy is driven now by finance capital. We saw what happened in the housing sector. In similar fashion, finance capital looks increasingly to the food sector for high rates of profit. These processes of financialization of food manifest in several ways. One is that Wall Street is speculating in agricultural futures as never before. There's been a surge in speculative investment in, a, in commodity markets. In a five-year period from 2003 to 2008, finance capital invested in agriculture jumped from $13 billion to $260 billion. That's a 1,000% increase in five years. Two, we find national regulations changed to accommodate a new form of global sourcing. For example, you might have seen in the news this week uh, the, the, the Obama administration is opening the way for U.S. poultry producers to send their chickens, live chickens, to China to be processed and then returned to the U.S. food system to be found in the likes of soups and frozen pot pies. Three, Corporations increasingly scan the globe for the cheapest possible inputs to be combined in foods that are processed to give the illusion of choice. Markets are dominated by corporations seeking the highest returns on investment, disconnected from quality, nutrition, health, farming, environment, etc. And there's two terms that are used by the industry that tell us a lot, and I learned about these from a book called uh, entitled Salt, Sugar, Fat by Michael Moss. The first term is stomach share, the amount of digestive space that any one company's brand can grab from the competition. And to do that, you have to design foods with vanishing caloric density, foods that melt away in the mouth and fool the brain, allowing you to eat more. Think Cheetos. So why does it matter that the food system is now a finance system operating through food. It changes the logic and nature of the food supply. Global industry is seeking to enlarge your gut. It's increasingly separated from questions of health, nutrition, quality, need, etc. And that's not to ro romanticize what came before. It's occurring along with intensified speculation in agricultural land markets the so-called global land grabbing. So for example, Cargill buying land in South Asia and East Africa, anticipating price spikes in food commodities, um, also driven in part by increasingly unpredictable climate. So back to Miami. We are not outside the global, but perhaps we can use it in the way <clears throat> that we were first brought into conversation with that system. Perhaps we can use the way we were first brought into that system to our advantage. From the turn of the century on, the spaces of Miami were defined not only by typical urban development, but also by orchards, gardens, farms, and backyard trees. Our food has been connected to the global for centuries, not necessarily bad. There are bad things about the system now, but if we start thinking of the kinds of things that were brought in earlier in the century, mangoes, guavas, papayas, etc., these are foods we can turn to for a more diverse and nutritious diet. And remembering who originally introduced them and cultivated them might help us expand a limited local food movement. Digging farther back, we can recover food crops displaced by that earlier wave of globalization, such as our Everglades tomatoes, Seminole pumpkins, and so on. Both of these are delicious. They may catch on. They might become global. <laughs> so when it comes to our food, the global is always embedded in the local, and the local in the global. Knowing all of this, we have to ask, how might we renegotiate our global local food system to be healthier and more just? And I'll end with that question and pass the baton to you. <laughs> Hi, my name is Muriel, and um, I started a 
a vegetable farm in Miami a couple years ago, three years ago actually, um, called the Little River Market Garden. Um, and before I started my own garden, I guess the beginning of the story is um, when I started to realize a lot of the things you were talking about. Just from just from paying attention of you know what was going on at the store when I went to go- buy my vegetables um, and reading books like The Omnivore's Dilemma, which came out around the time that I became really interested in the subject by Michael Pollan. That book really opened my eyes, and then then I started researching more and more, and it was like a bottomless pit of information, really scary information. Um, how you know just the food system is this monstrous thing that is very confusing and um, mysterious and sort of uh, it it makes for you know eating not being a very enjoyable thing um, especially on a budget and um, I I really wanted I really wanted to sort of take just a little more control of my own food and that's that's how it started so I did um, I did a for my first internship on an organic farm here in Miami this is where I was raised so I started you know I started here and then um, I had no idea what that was going to be like I had never really been on a farm before even I grew up in the city and uh, right away it was very inspiring and and really hard work but I I was motivated um, not only by uh, what I was like learning on the farm but by I kept reading and doing my own research on the internet and, and reading books and finding all kinds of PDFs about stuff and I was I I was very studious about it Um, and then I followed up with another internship and and another and uh, after three seasons of working on farms side by side with the farmer which was its its own really valuable great experience I decided to come back to Miami and um, start my own garden I wanted to sort of test it for myself all the things I had learned I wanted to make my own decisions and I felt like that was the kind of like my if 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 I framed it as going to college the internships that would have been my senior year my my last sort of my thesis would have been to to do it on my own and um ever since I've been doing a farming in Miami it's it's been amazing to see how what a, you know what an amazing uh response the community has given what i do it's it was almost effortless to to you know to get my csa members uh, for those of you who don't know what a csa is it's um it was what made what i do possible it's uh, a model of farming that makes it very financially secure for the farmer because you sell uh, shares of your harvest before you even plant anything. It, this is something that farmers have been using since the 60s, maybe even before. Um, and it, it's something that supposedly like kind of saved the small family farm. Because, um, uh, yeah, it gives you some financial security. So you, you sell shares of the harvest before you even plant anything. You've got, you've got everything already sold, and then you produce it. So there's a little bit of pressure there, but it works out. And... Um, so it was almost effortless for me to get my members, and I've, from the very beginning, uh, Miami's been just really like hungry for information, and I've I've done talks and farm tours, and there's a lot of involvement and a lot of interest, and it's been really kind of eye-opening to see um, how much people are are interested in sort of reconnecting with their their food source you know their local food source um so as i as i keep doing what i do and i keep learning uh, i have i have interns and i have visitors and everyone sort of learning with me and growing with me and um it's it's, you know it's been really good (laughs) so that's just the little bit of a background about what i do and hopefully it can fit into the conversation that we have today with with these guys. Hey, let's see. Is this working? Okay. Thanks very much for being here. My name is April Merlot, as the introduction said. So I was given the prompt, I was asked to speak about whether Miamians' attitudes towards food were improving or regressing. 
<laughs> this is not a question that I feel competent to answer, not only because I'm relatively new to Miami, but also because my disposition as a historian is to not answer this kind of question. Basically because I think that you can't say whether something is getting better or worse unless you've specified what standard you're comparing it to. And I'm not sure whether or not we should be setting standards for anyone but ourselves. I say this because I think more often than not when we make judgments about what other people are eating, we're showing our biases about other aspects of their lives. We may be judging them for being lazy, for spending their money or their time in a way that we don't approve of, for being poor, or maybe from, for being from a different ethnic group. And as a historian, I know that standards for what is a good and healthy diet have changed over time. So to take one of my favorite examples, pickles. Garlicky, sour, salty, brined pickles. In the late 19th and early 20th century, immigrant children in big cities would eat them as cheap snacks. So they would be sold by street vendors, uh, made in, in big barrels in the tenements of big cities like New York City and the Lower East Side. Middle class reformers were quite alarmed, quite in a panic, even went so far as to call pickles totally depraved. <laughs> Pediatricians had a long list of foods that you should never give to children. Besides pickles, this included condiments of any kind, celery, pork, griddle cakes, tomatoes, and pastries, among other foods. So of course, these prohibitions don't really make a lot of sense to us now. But at the time, reformers feared that they were a kind of gateway drug. They fell into this category that they called stimulants. And they were afraid that pickles would lead to alcohol use and probably crime. <laughs> so food historians think a lot about how societies define their collective identities through food, what people choose to eat, and really importantly, what they refuse to eat are often powerful symbols. So these choices symbolize who's part of the group and who's outside of the group. So what people eat with their families, the rules of etiquette and preparation, how they pursue health through their food choices, the kinds of stories that people tell about their favorite foods or their least favorite foods, the fact that special meals and special food rules are part of many religious faiths, and nostalgia for homeland or for distant loved ones that we remember through our sort of physical sensory experiences with food. These are all ways that we create a sense of community, a sense of identity through food. So back to the pickle haters for a minute. The pickle haters were hating pickles in a period of very high immigration between the 1890s and the 1910s, especially from Southern and Eastern Europe. So many of these immigrants are Jewish, they're Catholic, many ended up at least temporarily in very crowded um, sort of urban tenements. Native-born white middle-class reformers believed that these immigrants were racially inferior and that they could never assimilate as Americans. So pickles in that sense were really just one symptom of a much bigger problem. And reformers hoped that if they could convince those kids to give up their pickles, that they might be able to make good Americans out of them. So culmination of these sentiments did not result in pickle prohibitions, but in fact in very aggressive immigration restriction laws in the 1920s. This was neither the first or the last time that anti-immigrant sentiment has been expressed through food. So here's another slightly more recent example. In 1968, Newspapers started reporting a new illness, which they quickly dubbed Chinese restaurant syndrome. Some people started to notice symptoms, such as headache and dizziness, after eating in Chinese restaurants. Researchers quickly decided that the culprit was probably MSG, monosodium glutamate. For the next four decades, newspapers alternately reported that MSG was either really super dangerous or was totally safe. Despite inconclusive evidence, MSG phobia is now pretty widespread. For example, you'll find many Chinese restaurants that sort of um, prophylactically say no MSG on the, on the menu and on their signs. 
Most recent studies seem to suggest that there's probably not anything especially harmful for most people about MSG. So why all the fuss? Well, I'm a historian, so this is the kind of answer that I come up with. It's worth considering that in 1968, when this term Chinese restaurant syndrome was coined, was an especially difficult moment in the United States relationship with the communist world. Relations with China under Mao Zedong were especially tense because you'll recall, if, if you recall these things, that the conflict in Vietnam was at its height in 1968. In the United States, there was lingering suspicion that Chinese Americans might secretly be communist agents. Even Mao himself apparently got in on the, on the concern, suggesting in radio broadcasts that counter-revolutionaries were poisoning China's MSG supply. Those might even be Americans that were poisoning Chinese MSG. So even in later decades when US-China relations were calmer, it seems likely that MSG phobia has lasted because it's linked to a cuisine that many people perceive as foreign. So my point here is that when we freak out about what people are eating, we more often than not are freaking out about something else entirely. What about the major public health crises we seem to be facing now? Don't we know that diet contributes to obesity and diabetes? Maybe. If we're talking about disease prevention, there are actually many ways to eat healthy, many factors that we don't fully understand. And there's not complete agreement about how best to address these issues. Take sugar, for example, which both Gail and I write about, we're the sugar ladies. In the time period that I study, in the early 20th century, people generally agreed that sugar was actually a really healthy food. Even, I mean, there were some quacks who thought it was, that thought it was bad for you, but even doctors really genuinely agreed that it was wholesome, healthy food that everybody should be eating. So obviously this is pretty different than how many people think about sugar now. Even though most people still eat quite a lot of sugar, I think we, many of us suspect that it might really be bad for us, and we maybe even feel a little bit guilty about eating it. Some experts say it's fine to eat sugar in moderation as part of a balanced diet. Others say that it is literally poison, toxic, and even minute quantities. Some people say that high fructose corn syrup is much worse than cane sugar or vice versa. Some people play it safe by using artificial sweeteners. Others wouldn't touch artificial sweeteners with a 10-foot pole. There are reputable scientists and nutritionists who will support all of these claims. So what is the right answer? I'm not sure. And to be honest, I'm a little bit suspicious of anybody who claims that they do know what the right answer is. So are Miamians' attitudes towards food improving or regressing? You guys tell me. <laughs> Hello. So I'm going to talk, my name is Keith. I'm going to talk about who I am, what I do, how I got to do what I do, and then how that all relates to this panel here tonight. So I'm a chef. I run a community pop-up cafe called Love and Vegetables. And what that means is we operate on a pay-what-you-can model for most of our events. And I follow the one world everybody eats standards. So that means you can come to one of my events. You can eat a meal, sometimes six, seven course tasting menu. And you can pay the suggested amount or you can volunteer your time, your efforts in exchange for that meal. I operate one dinner a month on the Earth and Us Farm in Little Haiti where I live. I also do events all over Miami, usually one a week in the peak season. I came to do this because I was working at one of the best restaurants here in Miami. I was also working as a forager for that restaurant chain, for that group. And I was going out to some of the local farms. I was going out to the produce market every morning. I was getting to know the farmers at the time I was living on an organic farm. And I started to see a divide from growing the food and then the people eating the food. On this journey, I've, I've discovered a lot. I used to work in San Francisco. I used to work in marketing and PR before I went to culinary school. I used to make a really nice six-figure salary. And then I, I left that to go to culinary school. My first job paid $9 an hour. And working in a restaurant, I started to see the people in the restaurant couldn't afford to eat at the restaurants they worked at. And working 60, 70 hours a week. And then living in a community like Little Haiti, I started to see more of that divide. Like here we are growing great organic produce, 
but who's eating this produce? Who's, who's getting their hands on the good local organic stuff? And it wasn't the people who I felt needed it the most, the food insecure. One in six million Americans are food insecure. One in four children are food insecure. And yet they're eating a lot of processed things. I was recently interviewed and I talked about how I went to Publix and bought an apple for $1.70. But two blocks from where I live on a farm, you can get three pieces of fried chicken for two twenty-five. If you have those two, if you have two dollars, what are you going to buy? So I set out on a mission to change that, to try to get some of this healthy food in the mouths of people who deserve it, or I shouldn't say deserve it, who I felt could benefit the most from it. So my first dinner, I just invited everyone I could. I went around the streets, I talked to people in the neighborhood, and I said, "Come eat." Whatever, pay whatever you can, and let's get this food to you. We had 20 people show up. It was a great success. And I've been doing this now for about 19, 20 months. It's important for me as a chef to, to get this food to those people. I remember I would buy a case of local escrow for $13. We would clean it up, cut it up, sell it for $7 a side. We would get maybe 40, 50 sh um, servings out of that case, of, out of that half bushel of escrow. And I'm thinking, wow, if we could just pay $20 and we could feed 30 people with that escrow. So how I relate to this is I'm out there every day. I'm going to the gardens. I'm growing food myself on the Earth and Us farm. I'm cooking the food for the people, and I'm trying to deliver that food for the people. Um, and in this process, I myself became one of those food insecure. I became a person who couldn't afford to go out and eat some of this food. And here I am running around trying to feed all these people, and I'm like, sometimes I forget to eat, or sometimes I don't have the means to eat the food that I would like to eat. And that's the gap that I see. That's the divide that I see. And that's what I'm trying to do, along with 30 other community cafes in the US that operate on the one world everybody eats, to get that food to the people. And it's, it's great to see what everyone is doing here. Muriel is doing a really great job with her CSA. And, and that's what I like to see, because CSAs help people get the food. They're not selling a lot to the restaurants. They're not selling the people who are upselling their products time and time again. So as a chef, I see that, I like that, I appreciate that. So how does this all relate? How does this all come together? It's, it's a complete life cycle, and that's what I've learned doing this work. That's what I've learned being on the farm. That's what I've learned growing the food, buying the food, foraging for the food. When I go out there and I, I start and I, I plant a seed, like right now is kind of the growing season in Florida. We're putting a lot of food in the ground. I see what it, it's involved to put that, put that seedling in the ground, to start that seedling. I know what it's like to go and pick that food, to process that food, to clean that food, to go to the markets and purchase that food and meet all the people that interact with that food to see the connection between it all. And then to have the opportunity to be a chef and cook that food for the people and prepare it with as much love as I possibly can. My pop-up is called Love and Vegetables because those are the two main ingredients that I put into my food. Love is a very important ingredient. I believe a lot in setting intentions. I believe a lot with cooking with mantra. I have a very spiritual aspect to what I do. And then from cooking that food to having the people come from the community, to having the people come and enjoy it and eat it and experience it. And on this journey, I've learned a lot. I never thought this running this community pop-up was going to take me on this spiritual journey. Because one, it made me food insecure myself. Two, it really tested me on every level possible to run a successful business, to get the word out there. And then to also feed people and pretty much not make any money doing it. And then to continue this process, <laughs> to keep going day after day. Um, we just did a big fundraiser recently because we didn't have enough money to buy transportation to, to do this work. We, we successfully raised $3,500 in a couple weeks, and now we have those means. So seeing this whole picture, seeing this all come together, it has, has been beautiful. Seeing people eat and enjoy it has been really life-changing. But I don't always get the people who need the food the most. And that's the journey that I'm on now is we, get, we got a lot of publicity. A lot of people know who we are and what we do and, and how it all comes together. I share as much of this process as I can by sharing pictures of farms that I source with, how I cook the food, the people who are eating it. But it's not always getting to the food insecure. Most of the people who eat my meals are people within those means who can afford them. And that is the divide I'm at now. It's how do I change that? How do I take it from people who don't need it to people who, de who do need it? But that's another question is, do, are the people I think don't need it, do they not need it? Because just because you're wealthy doesn't mean you know how to eat healthy. 
Just because you're wealthy and you have means to this local or organic or, or healthy food doesn't mean you know how to prepare it or cook it or use it. And that's what the changes we're making now is we're starting to get into the more educational aspect of this to teach people the whole process of growing it, of harvesting it, of preparing it, and of cooking it, and also enjoying and eating it. So hopefully this discussion, you can see the, the connection of it all, how we're all interrelated, how we're all trying to help each other, how we're trying to move this forward, this movement forward. So I thank you guys for listening. Thank you for coming out. I'm going to step aside now. When we uh, began planning these food events for the uh, upcoming academic year, I thought a lot about the first event, and I, I hoped that it would provide an introduction to what we're going to talk about for the rest of the year, and, and I, I hope for in subsequent years as well. I was looking for a sampler, something that, that presented a range of perspectives from informed and, and in some cases very passionate uh, points of view. I think we, we, I got exactly that tonight. I'm very grateful to the, uh, to the panelists for to giving us such a terrific presentation. Let me ask them first if, hearing what each of you have said, if any of you would like to add anything, and then we'll turn the uh, discussion open to you for your questions and comments. Okay, all right. Do we have any, would, would any of you like to say anything? Ron. Uh, yes. Yes. Um, but something Keith said sparked some thoughts. We, he kept repeating the word foraging. Uh, and I remember uh, as an undergraduate in San Luis Obispo, California, uh, we knew where there were uh, walnut trees on vacant lots and avocados and we would forage and eat these these orchard crops and I was just wondering if you know in in, in our neighborhood and, and I think probably in Little River and some of the older neighborhoods there's a lot of um, mango trees avocado trees carambola bananas and a lot of it just falls on the ground and rots and I'm just wondering if any of you know of any urban programs of culling to try to recover some of that food and and deliver it, or is it just too difficult logistically to get all that stuff? Because we're uh, streaming, the panelists are going to have to come up well, to the microphone. The mic and okay, I'll, I'll pat. I'm sorry. <laughs> of course. <laughs> I can sort of answer that question. Um, I mean, just with what I know, I mean, um, there are definitely efforts to do stuff like that, although I don't think that there's any one example that's, you know, great, the answer that's working, taking all that stuff to food banks or, you know, food not bombs or something like that. But there's uh, there, there are some farmer's markets that try to encourage people to bring that stuff to the markets and sell it if you have some of that stuff in your backyard. Um, a friend of mine who's actually here tonight is putting together a foraging sort of guide for specifically for Miami, which is going to um, show examples of all the different things that are growing out in the neighborhoods that you can you can harvest yourself. So that should be really good. Um, it's called Flora, so keep an eye out for it. Flora refers to you know our state, and um, it's going to be a really beautiful book. Um, so yeah, that's that's what I know of. So as for organized efforts, there's not from what my what I've learned, there's not a lot of community movement in picking up that food off the ground. There are some apps now you can get for your phone that will tell you you can plug in the coordinates of where you might see a mango tree or a sapodilla tree or mame tree and and as a f when I say I'm a forager, I mean that in two ways. The, the term's used loosely in the restaurant industry now, meaning I go to a, a farm that sells, and I give them my order, I pick it up, I take it back to the restaurant. They consider that foraging. But 
Sometimes the foragers get to walk around, see the field, see the produce, and, and hand pick it. To me, that's foraging on the commercial level, and that's great. I also get on my bike and ride around the neighborhoods and go to those mango trees and, and go in people's yards and get chased and, and yell that. And, <laughs> and even when I see them just wasting away on the ground, it's like, and I tell them, like, I could take this and use this in one of my dinners. And it's just a communication thing. So it's great to see some people wanting to keep their fruit. It's great to see it out there. It's, it's great to see those apps or those guides. But there is a lot of it out. There is a lot of waste. But it's beautiful to, to see it. But, um, so I see foraging on all ends. And my goal is to, to get as much of that as I possibly can because I see a lot of it going to waste as well. Thank you, all of you. I, I enjoyed the, um, the little lectures. Uh, I wanted to ask, what can we do in this day and age when so many people of, of many different backgrounds don't understand what processed food is, what's in it? I, I come across people all the time, whether it's my own parents feeding my children, my neighbors, even people at, uh, you know, very highly educated who don't understand. And I'm not saying people can't eat processed foods and that they don't have a place, but too often it seems like people have just, uh, you know, given up. They don't even want to know that it's just, you know, it's available. People use it, and there's not a lot thought of thought given to it. Um, and, and I think it's a concern that this is what a lot of people eat, you know, three times a day. I guess I'll start with a comment, and then maybe hopefully hand this off to April. <laughs> but I. I think that the first thing, and we do this a lot in, in my class, is just to get, look at some food closely and realize how weird some of it is. And we take it for granted, you know, like Lunchables. I mean, <laughs> what? <laughs> yeah, well, see, <clears throat> I hit a chord there. So, <laughs> I mean, why, you know? <laughs> And, and there's many other foods like that. And it's because we're used to them and because they morph into familiar forms. So, you know, it looks like, a, you know, a nice uh, homemade pastry or cookie, but it's something re really weird. And, and so I think that's what I meant when I said deconstructing our food. I mean, thinking, looking at it critically um, from the point of the food object um, and then sort of tracing it out and thinking about where it's come from. You don't have to eat like that. Um, it's not, it, it's, it, anyway, let, let me. Um, I thought of something that is not really an answer or, and I don't, I mean, it's, it's hard because I don't really want to tell anyone how to eat or how not to eat or what to eat. But um, in, my, in my own life, um, so I, I grow vegetables. That's the majority of what I do. And a lot of people always assume that I must eat really healthy all the time. <laughs> and then, then there's reality, which is that there's a lot going on in life. And um, I think what makes a lot of this processed food is the convenience. That's sort of the, um, the, the you know, that's sort of what it, what's got what's appealing about it. And so a lot of times, even me who has a whole like backyard full of really amazing vegetables I'll just go get something that's pre-made you know because I'm running around that day or something I think it kind of comes with living in a city um yeah. when I was living on on a farm in, in a very rural part of New York we made our own pasta we grinded our own flour you, you kind of go way more out of your out of your way to uh to um sort of prepare your own food fresher because it just goes with the lifestyle you know city is a much faster pace and there's temptations and there's convenience and there's people sort of tend to cram a lot more into every day. Um, maybe it just comes with living in a city. And so my the way I rationalize it in my head is to just sort of strike a balance, you know, sometimes like not too much of this, not too much of that, and then I can feel pretty good about it. So. I have a lot of answers. Maybe none of them are the right answer, but I have a lot of thoughts, I guess, is it? is the thing to say. So the first thing that popped into my head was just the sort of the literacy of reading labels, reading food labels. Um, and I think that's something people don't do. And it can actually just be an incredibly powerful exercise to read food labels. Um, and so I teach my kids 
to read food labels. And they've actually gotten to the point where they sort of mock me um, by saying, like, Mom, look, we we just ate some high fructose corn syrup. Um, and they, t- they say it to kind of torment me. But in fact, I think it's great because they're reading the food label. <laughs> so someday they may actually make some, some conscious decisions about it that, that I agree with. Um, not that I'm passing judgment or anything. Uh, so that's one thing. And then the other thing that I thought of is, um, so I teach this food history class. And um, one of the things I like to do is do tastings in the class. And I try to um, really push the boundaries of students' familiar tastes. So the first thing that I make for them, and I only teach the class every couple of years, so I don't have to do this that often. But the first thing that I do is I make bread. Um, to give them a sample of, and I call it my pre-industrial revolution bread. So it's all stone ground whole wheat. Uh, It's made with sourdough. It's made with turbinado sugar um, or muscovado sugar. So it really is incredibly unfamiliar flavor to most students. And so just the sort of sensory experience of realizing that the, the kind of flavors, the textures that they're familiar with are not sort of either the only way that things are or the only way that they've been, I think is incredibly eye-opening. And then I give them chocolate, but it's 80% cacao chocolate, and they all think it's disgusting. And and then yesterday I gave them pickles, because we were talking about pickles and pickle reformers, and they kind of thought the pickles were gross. And, um, you know, their comments are always like, it doesn't taste like the pickles that I'm used to pickles tasting like. So I guess that's one of the ways that I've sort of addressed that question in the in the kind of interaction that I have with people around food. And then the last thing I thought of when Muriel was talking about this issue of convenience, uh, this comes up with a lot of my students is um, this notion that when their mothers started going outside of the home to work, that people started to rely a lot more on convenience foods and people's, you know, the healthfulness of people's diets started to decline. And I'm inclined to question that a little bit, but I certainly know that in my family, we have two careers and two kids, and the only reason that we have a sort of a diet that we think is healthy is because we have two adults who are both committed to cooking and are both committed to childcare. So we're able to kind of negotiate that. And I know that that's not true in every family. And so somehow this, I think that is gender roles are in the mix somewhere um, in addition to the sort of pace of modern life. So none of that is exactly an answer, but it's a lot of thoughts. This one's interesting to me because I grew up eating processed foods, like bagel bites and Hot Pockets. And if you can microwave and buy it from Sam's Club or Costco, it was is what I ate. But I was also so picky that I wouldn't eat. You couldn't put a vegetable on my plate. I would just sit there and not, and not touch it. I didn't really start eating vegetables until I was 30 and went to culinary school. Um, especially onions. I, I despise the texture of an onion. But now it's all I, it's all I eat, and it just comes from from learning and education. On the Earth and Us farm, we have a young kids' day school there, a preschool, and, and these kids come, and, and they grew up mostly eating vegan, mostly eating healthy, and they don't know what a lot of that processed food tastes like. Like, I was grilling bunny dogs, which are marinated carrots on the grill, and they were like, bunny dogs, bunny dogs, yay! They were so excited, and I'm like, who are these kids? <laughs> like, <laughs> they're excited for a grilled carrot. And <laughs> but I, was, I loved it because I saw that you can grow up eating that way. You can grow up liking that food. For me, my palate happened to go towards, because growing up in a grocery store in Delhi, it was all processed foods. It was sugary foods. It was candy. It was hamburger helper. And it was those foods that are, are cheap and easy to make. And, th- and even, like Mariel said, now, being as busy as I am, you know, I turn the chips and hummus all the time. That's like my go-to, you know, high-fiber, high-calorie kind of food in between. Is it healthy? Not really. Is it vegan? Sure, as I eat. But it's still not a whole food. You know, I might buy, like, kale chips and think I'm, I'm eating greens, but it doesn't really work that way. <laughs> so a lot of it comes down to uh, <laughs> not, not, like, dehydrated kale, like kale, corn, spinach chips, which I just discovered and are good. Um, It's convenience, it's cost. When you only have $5, that $5 is going to go a lot farther if you have, you could buy it in processed food versus whole food, especially calorie dense foods. You know, you can get kale for $249 to $399, depending on on where you're buying it, or you can get a whole thing, like three packets of hamburger helper for like $5 and throw in a buck of ground beef, and you just fed your family for three days. So, I mean, that's. It's all factoring in. It's all involved. It's really hard to say because even if you're educating, even if you're feeding the kids right, 
they still have to go to school. They still have other people to play with. You still have your own convenience and cost. And a lot of people aren't reading the labels for what's in the food. They're reading the price labels. And I see it both and uh, an experience of both. So a lot of it comes through education. Yeah. Question. Here we go. Oh, I just wanted to add something to, to like this conversation that um, at least in, in like my experience and what I've learned, like I've also worked on farms and I come from a very culinary intense culture and food is much more than just like sitting at a table and putting a bite in your mouth and feeding your belly. Like you get nourishment from love, from the sun, from touching the earth, from, from talking to somebody. And I feel that in our society we have lost that communication a lot of actually taking the time to spend some moment in the kitchen with your family, like talking, like how was your day and putting that intention into the food and going outside in the sun and getting vitamins from it. And that convenience of going into the supermarket and having everything available and you being able to just like pick something and put it in your mouth, it definitely it feeds our belly, but we're not satisfied because there's so much more that we're not putting in our system that we keep eating more and more and more and more, but we're not we're not satisfied because we're not giving the body what we truly need. So if if we start like teaching also that to to kids and in our own homes, just taking the time to cook with your kids, like incorporate them into cooking, like make them, I don't know, like stir up something or just like watch or rinse this in the in the sink. Like you start teaching your kids that cooking is something that you can do in community and that it involves much more than just like sitting down and feeding your belly it's just it's a whole thing and i think i agree a lot with with what keith is is doing with love and vegetables like yes there is a lot of love there is a lot of intention and there's so much more than just solid food it's just it's a whole experience and when you have all of that you actually need less food you eat less We are guests, and I don't want to be a bad guest and overstay our uh, welcome. Uh, if you'd like to continue the conversation informally with any of our panelists, please do so. Thank you all for coming. I hope you will be able to attend the next food presentation, October 9th at Vizcaya. If you'd like more information, you can get it from the pamphlet up here. Thank you very much, and please join me in giving the uh, panelists a hand. Also, folks. On behalf of everyone here at Books and Books, I'd like to thank the panelists, Dr. Gillespie, uh, everyone watching at home, all you folks here. Uh, speaking of healthy eating, check out the menu here at Books and Books. I'm ready to go forage there in just a moment. So thank you all for coming. <laughs>